this conversation that we want to have today about race and about attraction and about is a preference or is a prejudice is a conversation which I have been hearing a lot, um, particularly in my work with schools. Young boys, young girls kind of saying, you know, I mean, that's, that's mostly the young boys saying, you know, I'm just not attracted to, to women of color or whatever the case may be. So that's why we're talking about it today, because of those of you who aren't uh, in high school, uh, a large portion of the girls on this chat are in high school. And this is something which really affects them. So we need to approach this conversation with a deep sense of sensitivity, that this is a hard conversation, that this is not just a random conversation that we're having a, you know, for, for no reason, that these are real emotions and that this is sensitive and this is also very triggering. So this conversation today, we're going to have in a very kind, soft, gentle way. We will not tolerate any racism. We will not tolerate any sexism. We will not tolerate any unkindness in the comment section. Particularly in this time of lockdown and in this time of COVID, I think it's really important. You know, it's kind of maybe a little bit nuts to think that we can have such a sensitive conversation, but this is your reality. This is people's reality. So it's important that we continue to have these conversations around social cohesion. That's, that's my belief. This conversation is important because there are young girls and young boys and young people of color out there who are constantly being told that, sorry, I'm just not into you for X, Y, Z reason. So I think the way I'd like for us to approach this conversation is in the following way. Number one, this is not only about bashing white people and that white people say this. This exists in communities of color as well, all for the same reasons which we're gonna chat about, but it exists in communities of color uh, when it comes to colorism, light skin, dark skin, and the beauty that, that's attached to that. This is also not confined to heterosexual relationships. In LGBT relationships, this exists. In the gay community, this exists, right? This is not only confined to school, this exists in different class spaces. So this is a conversation which is far reaching and we need to have it. So we're not here to bash white people, nor are we here to exempt any of us from this conversation. It's incredibly important. And I think it's important for us to take a moment to appreciate, particularly as a white man, the privilege of being on the right side of beauty standards that I am always going to have um, my skin color, my body appreciated, acknowledged, okay? So we need to also own that sense of privilege and understand that not everyone is on that side. And for those of you who aren't, it's incredibly painful, particularly at a time of high school when you are framing your identity. So we're gonna have a little bit of, so that's some of the framing. It's important that we get some of that out of the way. And again, you guys feel free to comment throughout and ask me questions throughout. I'm actually gonna start with a question for you. When you think of your favorite holiday destination, what about it do you find safe or familiar or likable? When you think about your favorite holiday destination, what about it do you find safe or familiar or likable? Just type in the comments. When you think about your favorite holiday destination, maybe it's one you go to every year with your family, what about it is safe? What about it is familiar? What about it is likable? Hey, Courtney is in here online. That's lovely. Welcome. So what about your favorite holiday destination is safe, familiar, likable? I want to hear from you. Let's see some of the comments. So for me, my childhood um, Destiny, holiday destination was Umhlanga, so we would go every year, and yeah, that's a kind of just has very happy memories. So the culture, totally. The nature, mm, very cool. Let's see some other comments. When you think about your favorite holiday destination, what about it is safe, familiar, valuable, likable? I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey with this conversation today. The people, totally. I'd love to know what about the people exactly. When we think about your partner or your best friend 
or your closest friend or a cousin, somebody close in your life, what characteristics or qualities for you do you find, or rather what qualities within them do you find to be safe, familiar, valuable or likable? So when you think about your partner or your friends or your best friend or a cousin, anyone who's close to you, what qualities or characteristics of them do you find safe, familiar, valuable or likable? So for me, one of my, my best friends, it's trust, right? We always have each other's back and that's really wonderful. So Sam Barney, the regular place in interact with family, preparing meals, playing board games and the joint activities of skiing, getting your body moving and feel free. Wonderful. Hi, Shani. So when you think about your partner, what, are, what qualities or, 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 or um, so partner friends or qualities or characteristics do you find safe, familiar, valuable and likable? Loyalty, sharing the same values. Cool. Sympathy. Mm -hmm. Totally. What else we got? So yeah, loyalty, sharing the same values, sympathy. When we think about our honesty, totally amazing. Amazing. So the reason why I'm asking you to think about these emotional availability, the reason why I'm asking you to think about what it is that we find safe, familiar, valuable, likable, is incredibly important. Why is it incredibly important? What we need to understand, the things that we find safe, familiar, valuable, likable, are what we would call value judgments, right? Value judgments, things that we value. So the judgment of something and whether it has value or doesn't have any value. Now, why is value judgment so important to this conversation? Value judgments are so important to this conversation for this reason. All the things that we find to be safe, familiar, valuable, likable in our lives are not just in jail, they just happen to be like them. We have been taught to like these things. We have been taught to value compassion and non-judgment. We have been taught to like certain things. We've been taught to enjoy certain foods. We've been taught to find certain things valuable, safe, familiar, and likable. Now, why this is important is for this reason. When we are thinking about diversity, and, and for you Brescia girls, remember we did this exercise when we said, what is my body, this white male? What does it represent on the streets in South Africa? Without you even knowing me, what would you say? Oh, given everything, privileged, didn't, work, didn't have to work a day in his life, went to Crawford, uh, UCT, uh, quirky, maybe queer if he's got an earring. So without you even knowing who I am, just looking at my body, you already know whether I'm safe, familiar, valuable, and likable. Not because you know who Roy is, but the things that my body, my skin color, my identity represents is safety, familiarity, value, and likability. So if we think about diversity, so underneath here, this box is what we would call our value judgments. So the things we find safe, familiar, valuable, likable. Diversity, our differences, race, gender, sexual orientation, language, culture, religion, all of these things, are att we attach a certain value judgment to those diversity elements. That's the issue. There's nothing wrong with our differences, right? Everything is wrong with the value that we attach to those differences. Now, where am I going with this? The things that we find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable, we have been taught to find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable. And in a country like South Africa, or really the whole world, in a system that has been designed to exclude, to prejudice, to be violent against people who are not white, so people of color, violent and prejudiced and exclusionary of women, of gay people, of people who aren't first language English speakers, who aren't Christian, in a world that has taught us to find people who are not white men straight as unvaluable, then surely the things that we find safe, familiar, valuable, likable are not going to be the things that society has taught us to find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable. Let me repeat that. Given our historical context of exclusion, 
colonization, seeing particularly people of color as less than, as primitive, as uncivilized, seeing women as less than, not capable of being in the workplace, seeing gay people as sinners, as being um, all of these things. These cultural elements come in to our life and affects the things that we find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable. I don't know if you guys remember, but I did that, um, uh, that conversation about the Apple Watch versus the, sun, the sundial, right? The Apple Watch versus the sundial. And none of us know how an Apple Watch works necessarily, but we kind of know how a sundial works. And then what I said to that class at the time, I said, all of us like to think that we're this Apple Watch, that we've got our own programming, that we fresh out the box with our own thoughts, our own beliefs and our own opinions. But really, the sundial is the oldest ancestor of the Apple Watch. And every Apple Watch has a bit of that sundial in them. Much like with us, even though we're young, we think we've got our own opinions, we're woke, all of these things, we all have a bit of Apple Watch a bit of the historic exclusion, discrimination, hate of the other in us that affects the things that we find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable. Now, when we're thinking about attraction, this is a fundamental aspect of attraction, are the things that we find, you guessed it, safe, familiar, valuable, or likable. What we find safe, familiar, valuable, likable affects our decision making. And there's a lot of conversations around decision making and how decisions are made. So I'm not going to go into that too deeply. But if we can start seeing attraction, not as biological, because remember, we like to think it's biological, but it's not biological. When we can actually start seeing attraction as a decision, make, as a decision that we make, and then that decision is influenced by the things we find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable. And the things that we find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable, we've been told to find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable. And the things that we've been told to find safe, familiar, valuable, likable are whiteness, straightness, men, masculinity, English speaking, and anything that's not that we see as less valuable, then surely we would not make a decision to be attracted to anyone who's not safe, familiar, valuable, and likable. So when we're thinking about attraction, and I do believe that attraction is a choice or is a decision, even at a very, very subconscious level, we cannot avoid the discomfort that how we've been told and what we've been taught to see as safe, familiar, valuable, likable, as beautiful, has to influence our decision making and who it is that we find attractive. And there's so many other reasons, there's so many other um, understandings or things that influence that decision. Me, growing up in a white family, I, I had a family who, who wouldn't approve, who didn't approve actually, of, of the, the women at the time of color that I dated. It was very much something, you know, and some of their language would be, you know, it's gonna be hard for you, there's a clash of cultures, and all of these elements come into my decision making and they make me think, sure, I mean, I wonder if I, I wonder if maybe they're right, you know, maybe I shouldn't be, maybe I'm not going to pursue this attraction because if I do, and then all of a sudden I have to bring them home, there's going to be drama with my family. So you know what? I'm not going to do it. And I was going to say, I'm not attracted to people of color because it's kind of like a narrative that allows me to hide behind that shield. Um, so that's, that also comes into that decision-making process. Um, I've got a question here saying, please elaborate on how you believe attraction is a choice. I don't necessarily think that attraction is a choice. Okay, so this is going to be maybe a little bit complex and I'm going to, I'll tell you a story. Let me tell you the story. I remember the first time that I looked at a man and I was attracted to them. I was in my third year varsity down in Cape Town. I was sitting in a Mexican restaurant called, oh, what was that Mexican restaurant called? It was somewhere in observatory and I'm with all of my street guy friends in digs and this man walks into the restaurant and I'm like looking at him like, wow, that is a beautiful man. And that was really scary for me because like, no, 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 I'm not allowed to think that I'm not gay. I don't want to think that and I couldn't take my eyes off him, couldn't take my eyes off him. I'm like, no, 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 this is scary. And in that moment, while I'm attracted to that person, my decision is to not be attracted to that person. 
my decision is to choose otherwise, even though inside something else is saying something to me, right? Or something saying something else to me. I've often thought after I came out and kind of later into my uh, adult life of being out that I could choose not to date men. I could choose to be straight, but that would be a choice that would be against what it is that I truly want. And I would make that choice to make my mom happy, to make my dad happy, to make some of the people around me happy, but it wouldn't be a choice for me. And again, I can kind of hide behind them and say, oh, I'm just not attracted to men. So it's not necessarily that attraction is a choice because I think there is a biology, but our decision to be attracted to somebody or not is totally, totally influenced by what we find safe, familiar, valuable, likable, and uh, other societal factors as well. So that's kind of um, a very much basic answer to that question. Um, I think there's a lot of research to be done on actually the biological reactions to things that we find safe, valuable, familiar and likable and its influences on the hormones in our brain. So we could actually argue that sometimes it is biological that you're not attracted to a certain type of person but that we've been taught to not be attracted to that person. Sam says, absolutely agree that there's an element of discomfort in challenging the values that make up attraction. And I think what, and a lot of the work that I do, and a lot of work that I'm very interested in, is how we use norms or narratives or common phrases very loosely. We've almost normalized these things when really behind it, it's hiding a lot of discrimination, racism, and exclusion, right? So something that happens in the corporate world a lot is people in HR who are doing hiring, you know, we just can't find good black talent. We just can't find good black lawyers. Now, in a country that is 90% black of a graduation population who is 70% black, you're telling me there's no good black lawyers, rubbish. But we have normalized that narrative. We've normalized that saying. So we can say it and everyone kind of accepts it. Oh yeah, no, you're right. There's no good black talent. But really behind it saying, I just don't think I want to give this person a chance because I don't find them safe, familiar, valuable and likable. And I'm scared to bring them into my team because if they let me down, what are we going to do? So a lot of times I think we say, I'm just not into you. Sorry, it's, it's attraction. It's, 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 what's it? It's my preference, not my prejudice. It's something that we've normalized to not have to look inside and be like, why is it that I don't find women of color attractive? Where does this come from? I wonder where this originates from. I wonder if we think about beauty standards and what we've been told by the media is beautiful. And then if we do a Google search of beauty and then there are no black people there, I wonder if that would have influenced my beliefs. And it does in a big way, right? I think we've been taught not to be attracted to categories of people and then say it's a preference. I 100% agree with you, Megs. That is exactly what has happened. But do you see how uncomfortable it is to have to look inside and say, well, what else have I been taught to believe that isn't true? What else have I been taught to believe of who is and who isn't safe, familiar, valuable, likable? I want to give you an example of how this happens in, real, in, in, in a real life example. So my mom is a 63-year-old white privileged woman. She lives in Bryanston and we have four nieces and nephews all under the age of nine. So I pick up my nieces and nephews on the weekend, we get in the car, we're all excited, we're going to eat pizza, we're going to do something and I open my windows, it's a hot summer's day and they all start freaking out. Roy, you can't drive with your window open, you gotta close your window, close your window and I'm like What's going on? Where, where, why, why? No, it's not safe in South Africa to drive with your windows open, they say to me. Now, I'm like, okay, where did you get this from? No, granny said that it's not safe to drive in South Africa with your windows open. Okay. So this is what literally happened to me. Now, let me explain to you what's happening in these children's brain. When my mom who's not saying anything else, but it's unsafe to drive in South Africa with your windows open, which may or may not be the truth, okay? But think about what's happening for these young boys and girls, my young nieces and nephews. Granny, somebody they trust, is saying it is unsafe to drive with your windows open in South Africa. Why? 
because of the people on the side of the road. Who are the people on the side of the road? The black men are on the side of the road. So the connection that their nine, eight and six year old brains are making is that it's unsafe to drive with your windows open in South Africa because of the people on the street. Who are the people on the street? Black men. Therefore, black men are dangerous. That is what happens and we create that narrative, right? They've created that link. So my mom never has to say, you know who are dangerous? Black men. She doesn't have to do that, right? And it's not even her intention to do that. She just has to say that it's unsafe to drive with your windows open and they're going to make that connection. And I believe that the same thing happens when it comes to attraction. From a very early age, there are things that are said, there are things that we see, there are things that we experience. You know, she's very pretty for a black girl. I've heard that, right? These things then implant in us without us even knowing and start forming into the things that we believe and to the things we find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable, and hence the things that we find to be attractive. Shoo, I mean, I just want to kind of check in because I think that these are intense conversations. And again, it's easy for me to talk about these conversations because I'm a white man. So, I've never grappled with this. Um, and I'd like to maybe just check in at this point, how are you guys feeling? How is this, yeah, how are you taking this in? Because I know this is particularly for the young women of color, this is a sore, because you're busy forming your identity and at moments being told, sorry, I'm not into you, as if that, that's okay, and that's rejection. And rejection is painful, particularly when you're forming your identity, particularly Sure, I mean, gosh, for anybody, right? So how are you guys feeling? How are you feeling? Yes, I'm safe, familiar, valuable, likable. <clears throat> and maybe one day we'll talk about unconscious bias. And unconscious bias is really um, the things that we don't find to be or the things we find to be unsafe unfamiliar unvaluable and unlikable that when we're thinking about unconscious bias um all we're really talking about for me at least are decisions and when we can unpack what influences our decisions which are things we find safe familiar valuable and likable then we can understand why it is that they are unconscious biases so you know, there's a lot of noise around unconscious bias, but I'm just like, let's just talk about our decision making. What decisions do we make? But how are you guys feeling? And do you have any questions? Or experiences you want to share? Yes, yes, yes. It's the same for me in regards to branching out of the constraints of parental opinions. It's nice to face the truth and have to branch out of safe, familiar, valuable, likable. Totally. But it's literally the scariest and the hardest thing you're ever going to do. So, you know, you're going against so much when you're saying, actually, I don't agree with that or I don't want to believe that. There's so much that is against us, right? From all over the side, media, your teachers, our curriculum, everything. That's, that's kind of designed for us to stay within the system. And when we knock on that door and we question it, there are always repercussions, absolutely. Um, but it's really important for us to start looking at the system, for us looking at where does this come from? And, and, and maybe while people, and again, I want to encourage you to check in to, for us to see where you're at emotionally um, so we can um, just debrief some of those. But actually, there's a, if white men don't approach black women, should we automatically assume rejection? Or do we try to find norms by approaching them? Wow, that is such an incredibly difficult question to ask. You know, I think that in my work with a lot of black South Africans, there is always the expectation first that a white person will be racist. And um, I don't think that, I think that that applies in this case as well. And I think that it's very difficult for me to say to you, oh no, you know, give them a chance because we exist in a society that is racist, that does breed um, white superiority and black inferiority. So I don't necessarily want to give you a cut and dry answer, but I do think that it is fair for you to feel skeptical to approach a black um, a, a white man um, and assume rejection. I feel like that might be very much a, a, a survival instinct. 
So, I mean, I'm always here for breaking norms, but I think we also need to create the emotional support around us that if we're going to be doing these very, very brave things, and look, it's not always going to be rejection. I don't want to be like all white men, not total monsters and pieces of shit and white women necessarily. But how do we kind of create that self-care? If we are rejected, what does it mean? How do we not internalize rejection? That this is not about me, this is about a system. Look, I say these things, but it's really, really, really difficult coming from me who hates rejection the most. Um, Samantha says, according to social psychology, attraction is the sum of proximity, shared values, social approval, and one thing I can't recall. There's one thing she can't recall. Like I'm reading it like the president read his address last night. Um, so when we're thinking about um, attraction, the, the idea of shared values, I think is really interesting, particularly in the South African space where definitely in my generation, there wasn't really that many shared values. Maybe your generation, there are more shared values and maybe that's why we're seeing more racial interaction, I would imagine. Uh, the social approval one I think we've spoken to, which is of critical importance, is that we don't want to be rejected. We don't, we want to be approved. We are communal creatures. So it's very rare that we'd go against something where we know that we could be rejected for it. So obviously it will affect what it is we find attractive and what is we attracted to if we know that we're going to be rejected as a result of that. Um, what is safe, really valuable and, uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. Hi, Roy. Uh, it is, is it fair to say that attraction lies on a spectrum? Some people lie at opposite ends of the spectrum, maybe because of slight social conditioning. So I'm not necessarily what, what the spectrum is. Usually a spectrum has, has two points. So if the spectrum is totally obsessed with and not interested at all, absolutely um, attraction is, is on that spectrum. And attraction also isn't only physical, right? There's also other elements that come into attraction, I think. So let me just reread this, that attraction lies on a spectrum, true. Some people are at opposite ends of the spectrum, maybe because of slight social conditioning. I'm not fully understanding your question, but happy for you to reframe and then we can, we can unpack that absolutely. <clears throat> um, where was I going with that little story I was telling? I can't really remember, mm, that's frustrating. I was talking about asking you guys to check in Hmm. You know, I was yeah. I I can't I can't actually remember what it is that I was asking and chatting about. Um, COVID brain is that a thing? COVID brain. But any other questions that you guys have? Um, oh, I think I know what I wanted to say. I think I remembered. Yeah. None of the work that I do is designed to exclude to shame, to victimize, nor to devalue or invalidate. Which is why I started off this conversation to say that this is not only a conversation for white people, this exists in communities of color as well. But the root is the same. The root is the same thing, that we live in a world that has said that white people are superior, are beautiful, are clever. So of course that would infiltrate communities of color. Absolutely, of course it would. That's why I said this is not just about heterosexual couples where we have Michael House boys saying this to women of color. We also have it in the gay community, in the queer community at large. This is something that we all have to be grappling with. Again, I've kind of lost my train of thought. God, I keep kind of shifting and, and, and chopping and changing. Um, yes, I remember. So none of the work that I do is about excluding or about saying that you're bad, that you need to go do your work, we're fine, I'm woke, I'm woke than you, you're not woke. That's trash and we all have work to do, all of us. And really I think when I was kind of thinking about today's conversation, what was the call to action for me is how do we take a moment just to pause and just to accept that the things that we find safe, familiar, valuable and likable, we've been taught to find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable. And that the things that we find to be safe, familiar, valuable, and likable affect the decisions we make every single day. And if we can just sit for a moment and acknowledge that we live in a world still today that discriminates, that devalues, that finds people unsafe, 
then we can understand that these things influence our decision making. And really, this is a moment for us to reflect, to pause and say, what do I find safe, familiar, valuable, likable, and why? How do we start separating what I find safe, familiar, valuable, and likable from identity, from diversity? There's nothing wrong with being black. There's nothing wrong with being white. There's nothing wrong with being Indian, colored, Asian. There's everything wrong with the value judgment that we attach to it. So when we can start breaking down the value judgments, the safe, familiar, valuable, likable to difference, all of a sudden we can celebrate that difference. Right? That's where we, we, where we need to get to. But first we have to sit with the uncomfort or the discomfort that we hold these value judgments and we've been taught to. So the call to action here today is really how do we take the time to go inside again and to look and say, what do I like? What am I attracted to? Where does this come from? To acknowledge that we live in a world that says that brown is not beautiful. Okay, and that's the hard truth. That gay is bad and sin. That women do not belong in the workplace. All of these things still exist, whether we like it or not. And for us to kind of say, how much of this have we internalized? It exists within us. Um, is it true that masculine energy is the more dominating force in a relationship, even within LGBTQ relationships? Sure. This is such a hard question for me to ask, uh, for, to answer. I'm going to, for a moment, talk about um, more esoteric stuff. So I believe that in our world there is masculine and feminine energy that is not necessarily attracted, that is that not does not necessarily attach only to men or only to women. That in our world of yin and yang, of black and white, of good and bad. Um, there is masculine and feminine, and that these two energies intersect and they are essentially part of the same whole, that all of us have masculine and feminine energies within us. Where this has got fucked up is that we have associated masculine energy only with men, or that the male figure is the embodiment of masculine energy, and we have made the female embodiment, the female body as the embodiment of feminine energy. And what we've done is we've created a binary. So there's men with masculine energy and women with feminine energy, and that's all you have. When really that man has both masculine and feminine energy, except society doesn't want to see, doesn't find men safe, familiar, valuable, and likable if they've got too much feminine energy. Similarly, society doesn't see women as safe, familiar, valuable, and likable when there's too much male energy or dominant energy. So we as society have shamed this broader understanding of masculine and feminine, and we've created that binary. These binaries do not exist. All of us have masculine and feminine energy within us. It comes out in certain times. It retreats. It shows its power. It, all of these things, right, happens on a daily basis. The, when we're talking about toxic masculinity, for me, my opinion, toxic masculinity is just the repression of the feminine energy to devalue the internal feminine energy and to hyper-masculinize that masculine energy when really we are all whole, we all have masculine and feminine. When in queer communities and LGBT communities, they're talking about LGBT communities and the queer community being a liberation for straight people, is that LGBTs, given that they already don't belong in society, that they've been excluded, they're like, well, fuck it, I'm just gonna own who I am. And I am an embodiment of the masculine and feminine. So a lot of us get to experience and play around with masculine and feminine energies because we're not constrained by a binary. So LGBT relationships are like any relationships. They have relationships where some people do display more masculine or more feminine qualities at different times. Um, I don't think uh, LGBT relationships, and I say this as somebody who hasn't been in many, um, is this holy grail of relationships. Absolutely not. Um, it's still very complex. I think the idea of masculine and feminine energy is something that affects all relationships. Absolutely. I want to reread your question. Um, is it true that masculine energy is the more dominating force in a relationship, even within LGBTQ relationships? So <clears throat> I'm hoping that what I've just explained is kind of debunk that. But where I think this gets tricky is when we start unpacking what masculine energy is. Um, masculine energy might be that dominating aggression provider, um, loud, 
assertive, where maybe the feminine energy is that nurturing, kind, caring, empathetic. Now, the reason I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to, to create that is only because we attach, like I said, the masculine to men, and then we value that more, safe, familiar, valuable, likable, and we attach these softer qualities to women and we devalue that. And like I've said, masculine energy and feminine energy exists in all of us, right? The only, so, so all of us are going to sometimes have dominating and sometimes nurturing if we allow ourselves to do that. So yeah, um, I don't think LGBT relationships are any different. I think that we, our construct of how we understand masculine, feminine and energies needs to radically shift. Um, Sam says, yes, as a feminist, the feminine and masculine energies in relationships haven't really made sense to me. <clears throat> and I think the only reason, Sammy, that, that that's that's maybe sorry let me not be um so sure of myself maybe a reason why that is it because that we have embodied the masculine energies in the body of a man and the feminine energies in the body of a woman when really that is an incorrect um creation of the binary that is a misunderstanding um and something that again like i said we've been taught to see as safe familiar valuable likable we have been taught that society has instilled that in us it is not natural nor is it the truth that only men have masculine qualities and that only women have feminine qualities please this is so critically important the idea of gender is absolutely a construct that has been created does it mean that there are not actual men and their women of course not but it does mean that how those roles play out has been predetermined right could a relationship work if both people exert more feminine energy? Yeah, absolutely. You'd just like chat all day and you'd check in and you would just be so nurturing and loving. Absolutely. Totally 100%. I do believe that even though we all have masculine and feminine energies within us, some people are more attuned or more comfortable with certain energies. I'm terrified of violence. I'm terrified of my own internal anger. So I suppress it. And these things could be seen as masculine energy. So I suppress it. So yes, I mean, you know, both people asserting their feminine energy is totally possible to have. It's, it's not a puzzle. It's not like what's it um to what's a good analogy here it's not like um putting a you know two circles together when you're trying to fix a puzzle i don't know that was ridiculous i'm not thinking straight today of course it doesn't have to fit neatly like a glove they can definitely be more masculine and feminine and both masculine or both feminine within a space um i think it's and, and so really we all some people may lean more towards the one or the other but it doesn't mean that it's completely non-existent um, I wanted to ask if you think preference is a thing. Personally, I think preference disappears once we decide to step out of the value judgment bubble and see that attraction goes further. 100%, 100%, Megs. I think what we've been speaking about today is that preference is a construct. The things that I prefer, I have been taught to prefer. I am Jewish. I was brought up culturally as Jewish. We never had pork in our home or any pig product at all. Let's park for a moment that I'm now a staunch vegan. When I was a child, I was not. We never had pork in our house, so I never ate it. In fact, we, in the Jewish religion, see pork as unclean, right? We see it as unsafe, unfamiliar, unvaluable, and unlikable. So I would go to cult particularly traditional African cultural festivities, and there'd be tripe, and I'd never eat it, right? And what would I say? It's not my preference. I don't like it. I don't like our tastes. No, that's absolutely not the truth. I don't like what it tastes because it's not my preference because I've been told that it's not my preference. So it's easy for me to say, oh, not my preference when really it's actually, no, I've been taught not to like that. It's very similar with attraction. It's very similar with sexuality, I think as well. I didn't see anyone checking in, Ray, how they're feeling emotionally. So that either makes me very worried that you guys are feeling potentially triggered by this or that you're good. So <clears throat> which one is it? Sure, my voice is so fact, eh? Hmm. Any more questions or check-ins? We can start closing out uh, this conversation. 
I don't necessarily feel like I need to leave with a call to action for a, you know, go do these five things. I think having these conversations is really a great opportunity for us just to pause and to ask a tough question and to discuss something which we find always told to be undiscussable and to, you know, challenge ourselves to be more. Um, I want to just kind of say that attraction is complicated. It's not easy. What maybe I'm saying might sound quite simple, but just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. All right. Kirsty says, I'm feeling really good because this is a topic that is so prevalent today and needs to be addressed. And maybe just as a, as a, as a closing from my side for all the young women, young men, young people of color who are listening to this, is just, I don't know, a moment of real empathy, of feeling, sure, to internalize that rejection constantly as a young person, to ascribe rejection as badness, to internalize that you're not attractive, that you're not beautiful, that you're not worthy, worthy of love, I would imagine is absolutely devastating. And I really want to extend a huge kind of hug and kiss to you guys who have internalized your own unattraction, your own unsafety, your own unvalue, your own unfamiliarity, your own unlikability, because it's fucking bullshit. Um, and it's devastating that we still exist in a world that doesn't allow us the opportunity to challenge these. And for those of you who are on the receiving end, the victims of this, um, I really heart, my heart goes out to you. And for those of you who are not on the receiving end, who are white, um, actually, let's just say that, who are white, or in brown communities who are, are light-skinned, how do we repurpose that privilege? How do we create support? How do we have these conversations? How do we educate the people in our own communities? Such a pleasure, such a pleasure. Thanks for this conversation. Thanks, Roy, you've unpacked this so well. Such an absolute pleasure. Um, I am exhausted. So thank you for this time. Um, it's really a huge honor to have a conversation like this and a huge privilege for me to open up this conversation and have a couple people join in. Um, I will try to do it more often. Um, I don't, however, want to burden myself too much in this time um, and feel like I have to get something out because I think it's also time for me to take a breather and for me to just chill. But I think we're going to have a lot more. Um, I did have somebody message me and send me some really cool topics to chat about, white privilege or to talk about just woke generally, this idea of being woke. I think these would be really cool things to chat about. So please send me questions that you have or things that you'd like to talk about, or conversations. Again, if you are feeling at all triggered or you're feeling emotional, you're more than welcome to send me a private message. Nothing that we talk about or even none of the questions you ask will be linked back to you. More than welcome to check in with me. We can have a chat. Um, this is a very intense time for everybody. So our emotions are going to be raw. They're going to be on the surface. We're going to hurt deeply. And uh, I thank you guys for joining in this very potentially scary and sad and triggering conversation. Um, and yeah, just be safe, be kind to yourselves. Do not internalize that badness. You're hashtag beautiful, all of that stuff. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Again, if you want to chat again, uh, do tune in. I'll make that little like cute thing that I sent and put on my story and yeah. But yeah, let's find some cool questions to ask, things that are on your mind, things that you want to talk about. Guys, thank you. I'm going to log off. But uh, oh, Zoe's just um, Zoe just joined. And Zoe's be saying goodbye because it was actually 8 p.m. South African time. And I know that you're in Amsterdam. Meh. And that uh, Zippy Zoe's is the friend I was telling you about. My best friend that I was telling you about. Um, much love to everyone.